I'm Al O'Quinn, the senior pastor here at Bethany Baptist Church. I want to thank you for joining us on our television broadcast today. It's not by chance or accident that you've joined us today. I pray that as you tune in, you will recognize and realize God had you join us today because he has a message just for you. And so I hope that you'll listen intently and you'll be obedient to the prompting of the Holy Spirit as the Lord speaks to your heart today. God bless you and we'll go to the service right now.
You alone are God. You are our creator, our savior, our redeemer, our sustainer. And God, this morning we come to worship you because you're worthy. Father, I pray that this morning as we gather as a body of believers here at Bethany Baptist Church, Lord, that you would just fill us with your presence. Father, that we would worship you today, Lord, as our audience of one. Lord, that we would forget about everything else that's been going on this week, even the things that distract us this morning. Lord, we would just lift our voices of praise and worship and adoration to you because you're worthy. You're God. You are awesome and holy and magnificent and wonderful and worthy of praise. I thank you for every person that's here this morning and I pray, Lord, that uh, you would be with our guests today as they've come to, to worship with us, to see what you're doing in this place. And Father, that they would be drawn to you Lord, not because of us, but because of you and what you're doing. And Father, I pray that we'd be faithful and obedient to you, Lord, that we would demonstrate our love for each other. And Father, the world would see that we are your children, that we are your disciples because of our love for each other. Be with us today, Father, as we sing, as we pray, as we worship, as we hear the word of God shared with us today, God, that you'd be glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. A strong tower, the righteous run into it, and they are saved. Jesus is the name, sing it. Jesus is the name of the Lord. Jesus is the name of the Lord. Jesus is the name of the Lord. Most Proclaiming your great name that saves us from our sin. Thank you, Lord. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Sing with us. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem.
Somebody's praying I can feel it Somebody's praying for me Mighty hands are guiding me To protect me from what I can't see Lord, I believe Lord, I believe Somebody's praying For me Angels are watching I can feel it Angels are watching over me It's many miles ahead till I get home But I'm safely kept before your throne Lord, I believe Lord, I believe Angels are watching over me. Well, I've walked the barren wilderness when my pillow was a stone, and I've been through the darkest caverns where no light has ever shone. But still, I go home because there's someone. Who is down on their knees? Lord, I thank you for those people spraying all this time for me. Somebody's praying. I can feel it Somebody's praying for me Mighty hands are guiding me To protect me from what I can see Lord, I believe Lord, I believe Somebody's praying for me. Somebody's praying for me. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for putting people in my path, Father, in, in years past. And, Father, I know there's more in the future coming. I pray for our church, Father. I pray for our nation. I pray for our world right now, Father, because we need you. Father, I pray we hit our knees every night and every morning to lift it up and get our lives straight and on the path with you. Father, go with us from here. We love you, and we praise you. Be with our pastor as he brings a message. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We want to continue in our fourth uh, message in the series, I Am a Church Member. Why don't you open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 12. And uh, our subject this morning is, I Will Be a Praying Church Member. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him intending after Passover to bring out the people, out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, 
but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. We uh, talk a lot about uh, prayer and we think about prayer, but the truth of the matter is in the West, in America, in North America, there's very little prayer happening. It is a sad commentary on the life of the church in America. There seems to be mighty movement, a mighty movement of God all around the world. 30 to 40,000 uh, Chinese are coming to the Lord every day. And all around the world in different places, masses are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. But that's not happening in America. Uh, there seems to be a sense of apathy and uh, just being a feeling of mediocrity in the life of the average believer and the average church. There's no real sense of passion and uh, no sense of urgency. And what even is the degree of expectation of us as we come to church? Do we really expect God to show up? Do we really expect to enter, entertain God, to see God, to encounter the Lord? Um, statistic I heard recently at a meeting just a few days ago on the subject of prayer is that the average believer in America, average church member, spends less than 40 minutes a week in prayer. And you think about how most of us pray. Uh, we pray over our meals. We pray before we go to bed. We may offer a quick prayer for somebody that's sick. Uh, we may pray for somebody going through a marital conflict. But as far as having an extraordinary kind of prayer life where we spent a magnitude of, of time in prayer, we don't do that typically. That's the very reason we've not seen a, a mighty move of God in North America. Uh, the last time there was a spark of movement of God in North America was in the late 70s and the early 80s. And it was not a spiritual awakening. It was just a spark. There's no mighty move of God. And so we need to pray. And we need to understand the urgency of prayer. And uh, it says something about our walk with God and our understanding of fellowship with the Lord when we pray as little as we do, our prayer should be, Lord, forgive us for our prayerlessness. And uh, the Lord uh, would mark his church and identify his church as being a house of prayer. Now, the church is not this beautiful building we're in with the chandeliers and pews. This is the church house. This is the local church called Bethany. This is where we gather to worship. But this is not the church, this building. You and I, we are the church. And so the Spirit of God lives in me and the Spirit of God lives in you. And so when the Lord said, my house should be called a house of prayer, you know what I'm supposed to be called? I'm supposed to be called a house of prayer. You know what you're supposed to be called? You're supposed to be called a house of prayer. How in the world can we be called a house of prayer when at best, on the best average, we know the average believer and the average church prays less than 40 minutes a week. The Lord must be saddened and disappointed in our desire to meet with him and commune with him and encounter him in prayer. And yet the Lord gives us this great invitation in the book of Hebrews. He says, come boldly, come boldly before the throne of grace that you might obtain mercy and find rest to your soul." In Jeremiah 33, 3, he says, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you don't know anything about, but pray. And we need to be praying. So as a church member, we vow and make a commitment. I will be a praying church member. We need to pray for one another. We need to pray for the pastor. We need to pray for the staff. We need to pray for the deacons. We need to pray for the Sunday school teachers. We need to pray for the ushers. We need to pray for those working cameras. We need to pray for those keeping the babies. We need to pray for those working for students. We need to pray for one another. We need to pray for all the leadership. We need to pray one for another. And the scripture even says, God forbid that I should sin against you and failing to pray for you. 
And so we must pray. And so I will be a praying church member. Well, in the text we read today, it seems the early church came to a real defining moment early on in its inception. They find themselves uh, in uh, warfare. It was a time of warfare. Now, we understand something really happens. Something really happens when God's people pray. And so here in the early church, Herod had apprehended James, the brother of John, and he killed him. He cut his head. He killed him. Put him to death with a sword. And all the Jews rejoiced and celebrated because James, the brother of John, is dead. He's one of those guys that followed Jesus. He was in the inner circle. He's dead. And when Herod saw that that uh, martyr, that martyrdom, that death of James pleased the people, he apprehended, he apprehended Simon Peter. And the Bible says he put Simon Peter in jail, put him in prison, and he put four squad of guards around him. There were about 16 soldiers around him, four at a time, two on the outside of the cell or in the, where he was incarcerated, probably two chained to him. And he said, after Passover, we're going to pre- present Simon Peter to the people. We're going to kill him. He's going to be executed. So you watch him. So it was a time of warfare in the life of the early church. They're under attack. James, brother, James has been killed. Peter's in prison. And uh, it was a difficult time, a time of warfare. For the early church, it was a time of apprehension. For their leader, Simon Peter, has been put in prison. It is upon him, the Lord said, I'll build my church, that confession, and the, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, Simon Peter was the leader. He had a boldness about him after, the Pentecost, after Pentecost, the falling of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And that guy that ran and hid when Jesus was crucified and denied the Lord, now has a boldness. The Spirit of God is in him. Well, he's the leader of the church. He's the leader of these, these people following Jesus. He's in jail. And so there's a spirit of apprehension in the early church because their leader is in prison. He's in jail. And now what's going to happen? What happens to the church if they kill Peter? And so there's a, there's a spirit maybe of fear. They're frightened. And, and so the adversary is going to and fro. Now, Herod is an adversary. And uh, the Jews that are against Jesus, they're adversaries. But the underlying current of what's happening is Satan. And his hell, uh, de- demons of hell and powers of darkness. That's, that's the adversary. The Bible says that he's like a roaring lion going to and fro seeking whom he may devour. He is our adversary. The battle we fight, church, is not against one another. The battle we fight is against the powers of darkness, principalities, things of the heavens. He is the prince of the air. It is a spiritual warfare, and the adversary is at work. And so he's working there in the early church. He causes fear. Fear has gripped their heart. They know they need to pray. And you and I, when we find ourselves in times of uh, apprehension, we need to pray. When our hearts are gripped with fear, we need to pray. In times of crisis, we need to pray. And so they prayed. They prayed. Now, we understand that we live in a day when the church is being persecuted. We're seeing some degree of persecution in America in that folks say, we don't want you praying here. We don't want you praying there. We don't want the Bible here. But that's nothing compared to what people in other parts of the world are dealing with when it comes to persecution. They're losing their very lives. Now, that's not to say it couldn't happen here. It could happen here. But we need to pray. We have, a, we have, a, we have an avenue we have a we have a capability of finding strength in the midst of persecution it's in the prayer closet it's as we pray so the early believers they recognize we're in warfare a season of warfare they understood it's time to pray so now it was a time of prayer it was a time of prayer and it says in that fifth verse that they gathered in a home and they began to pray James is dead, Peter's in prison, and the church is driven to her knees to pray, to pray, to pray. That is the position of warfare. Do we even know where the battle's fought? Where is the battle fought? The battle is fought in the prayer closet. Jesus said, go into the prayer closet, get away, get still, get silent, get away, and pray. The problem for us in the West is we have a hard time being still. For any period of time. And we're all guilty. We're we're so caught up in the technology with our phones and Facebook and social media that we have a hard time being still. I mean, as soon as you walk in the house, you turn on the TV. We got to have noise. We have to have noise. We we can't handle 
silence and being quiet and being still. And the Lord says, be still and know that I am God. Just be still. Is there any wonder that, that for the average believer we spend less than 40 minutes a week in prayer? To, to spend any more than that might drive us over a wall because we can't stand silence. And yet it says something about the weakness of our own relationship with a heavenly father because we don't want to meet with him more than we do. The early church was driven to her knees. They recognized it was a time for prayer. The battle is fought in the prayer closet. Now notice the kind of praying they did. It was a fervent kind of praying. When they prayed, it was a fervent kind of praying. It is to be made without ceasing. The Bible says pray without ceasing. That word to pray without ceasing means to stretch forth. It's a medical term that refers to the, the stretching of a ligament or pulling of a muscle. It actually means go beyond the boundaries. So to pray fervently and without ceasing is to go beyond the boundaries of normal prayer. It's extraordinary kind of praying. Edwin Orr, who was a great uh, historian of spiritual awakening, wrote a book called The Flaming Tongue. And in The Flaming Tongue, he documents the mighty moves of God in North America in days, days, many, 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 many years ago. In 1850, thereabout, businessmen started gathering for prayer in New York, and they prayed, and things began to catch on as they'd close their shops and close their businesses at noon to pray. And as people started praying and saying, we're going to designate a time for regular, extraordinary kind of praying, let's see what God can do. And a prayer movement began, a prayer movement started where people were fasting and praying. And people were being engaged in extraordinary kind of praying, praying for hours. The guy that spoke to us the other Thursday night about prayer said just recently he was in a prayer meeting in Arkansas where over 25,000 people came just to pray. And the prayer meeting was longer than an hour. It was for several hours as they prayed. No singing, no preaching, just praying praying now you know what if I announced well I know what crowd I'm in now so if, if I were announced that gold city was coming to sing anybody like gospel music you know who they are this place be packed but if I say we're going to have a prayer meeting it'd be me and a few more see how it's got our hearts If we say we're going to have some entertainment, we're going to have gospel singing, some well-known gospel singer, place fills up. But if we say, come, let's pray, very few show up. Why is that? Because we don't understand prayer. and We really don't have a heart for God in prayer as we ought. It says also that we want to be entertained. It says that we like patting our foot, clapping our hand, enjoying the music. We like being entertained, but this thing of prayer is work. Yes, it is work. It's fervent prayer. It's to go outside the bounds of praying, this extraordinary praying. And the idea is go outside the bounds. It's extraordinary kind of praying. It's fervent praying. James 5, 16 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It is energetic passionate praying it's not sluggish praying it's not uh, lifeless praying it's not casual praying it's not apathetic praying it is a praying of a desire and desperation for God to show up and when you study the great awakenings of times gone by wherever God has moved on the hearts of people to pray to pray to pray to devote hours to prayer to devote hours to prayer in time, God has manifested himself in a powerful way. There is even now in this time a call for prayer for America, national revival, by our own denominations, but by other denominations in America. Don't you think, church, we need God to show up in America? We do. And we have to pray. It is a fervent kind of praying. What else did they do? It was a faithful kind of praying. They prayed in faith. They prayed believing. There was the power of agreement. Now you say, well, that's the problem with Baptists. Can you get two Baptists to agree on anything? Well, it's not. Understand this thing about the prayer of faith and agreement. 
What is the agreement? It is the agreement that God can do anything. Do you believe that? God can do anything. Now we say, well, we believe that. God can. All right, there's another step. God will. Well, we know God can, but we're not really sure if God will. Well, we operate within the sovereignty of God and the providence of God and trust in God. And the scripture says this is a confidence we have in God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we have the petitions we desire of him. So I want to pray in the will of God. I want to pray inside the perimeter of the will of God. But it is a power of agreement that nothing's too hard for God. And so in marriage, God's got a husband and a wife. That's a prayer team. That's a prayer that, that, that two can agree. But it's not just being married. You can be single. But there are people in this church that are believers, and we come to a gather in agreement. People you work with that are believers, you come into agreement. God can. And we pray in faith because the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. But we have to pray. Now what is it that drives us? Well, it has to be fervent praying. It has to be passionate praying. It has to be faithful praying. But it has to be focused praying. What's that mean, preacher? Focused praying. Well, in the case of Acts 12, their prayer is for Simon Peter who's incarcerated. He's in prison. He's got guards chained to him. He's got guards outside the, the door. And they're praying for Simon Peter because all they know after Passover, he's going to be put to death. And there's a spirit of desperation. They're in a crisis moment. There's the spirit of desperation. I want to tell you, the way you'll get a man on his knees is he get desperate for God. The way you put a woman on her knees, she gets desperate for God. And here's the thing. We can get desperate when it's about our children. We can get desperate when it's about my wife or my husband. We can get desperate when it's somebody that needs a healing or they need a touch for help. But where is the longing to see God move in America? Where is the longing to see God move in his church and we get so desperate for God to work, we'll go days without eating. That's called fasting and pray. You see, when we're desperate, we're willing to pay the price in prayer and do the extraordinary thing kind of things. It's focused praying. Now, the praying they did was not in generalities. We pray in generalities. You know that? God save all the lost people in the world. Amen. Now, you know what? If that's the best you can do, do it. But if we're going to be what, what God calls us to do in focus praying, you and I on our prayer list ought to have the names of some lost people, and we're calling the names of those lost people before the Lord. It is a specific, focused kind of praying. When we pray for folks that are sick, it is a specific, focused kind of praying. When we're praying for a revival, it's a focused kind of praying. They did not pray in generalities in the early church in this situation. They prayed for Simon Peter. And here's the deal. I could ask some of you, and I'm not going to do that, but I could ask some of you, has God answered a prayer for you this past week? Is God answering prayer? And you might say, well, I better say, yeah. I'm gonna, yeah. Well, what? The, 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 the tragedy is for us, our prayers are in such generalities that we can't tell you whether or not God has answered a prayer. But when you had prayed specifically about a situation, a case, prayed by name for a situation, prayed by name for an event or whatever, you can mark it. You got it in the book. You put it in your prayer journal. God answered this prayer. And so they're praying specifically for Simon Peter. But also it was a time of power. They prayed and when they prayed heaven heaven rumbled and hell trembled wouldn't it be great that we had such a relationship with the lord and spent so much time with god in prayer and were marked by prayer and truly with a house of prayer and when we prayed earth trembled Here, here's what the devil doesn't want to happen the ne devil n wants us never to learn to have a heart for prayer it's okay to sing it's okay to preach it's okay to go to church it's okay to have bible school it's okay to have bible study it's okay to do all that church stuff and all that religious stuff just don't pray prayer releases the power of god prayer releases the unction of god prayer brings the anointing of the lord prayer brings the engagement of god you have not because you ask not And I will confess to you, there was a time years and years ago in my early days of ministry that, that I might stand up and 
preach and had not spent a whole lot of time in prayer. But I'll tell you this, I don't do that anymore. I never step up, as uh, some say, behind the sacred desk. Lest I've spent some serious time in prayer. You see, we have to pray. Because prayer, prayer releases all your eternal resources and prayer can get what God can do and we have to pray. And for them, it was a time of prayer and unction. And, and you and I need to have such a connection with God that when we pray, hell trembles. It was said that Mary, Queen of Scots, feared the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies of England. She feared the prayers of a Presbyterian. He knew how to get in touch with God. Do you know in the 1850s, or way back there sometime, I can't remember the date exactly, but way back there when they were trying to get people to pray, it was in the Presbyterian church, they would go from door to door, the preacher would, and say, if your family is not having family altar and praying, I'll not serve you communion. If your family is not praying and have family altar, I'll not serve you communion. If your family is not praying and have family altar, I'll not serve you communion. Scared them to death. They started praying. And when they started praying, you know what happened? God started working. Wouldn't it be an awesome thing? Wouldn't it be amazing to see what God would do at Bethany Baptist Church? Everybody that's here today would spend all this coming week praying, praying, praying earnestly that God show up in a mighty way next week. Might blow the doors off this place. But we have to pray. We have to pray. And it was a time of prayer for them. It was a time of power because they prayed. And you know what happened when they prayed? They saw the mighty hand of God. Now, here's Simon Peter. He's in chains. He's got guards all around him. And they're praying that Simon Peter would be released, that God had intervened and God had worked. And, and they're trusting. They're believing. And they're in the prayer of agreement, power of agreement. And they're asking the Lord to move and work. And the angel of the Lord shows up in the cell or in the holding area where Simon Peter is. An angel is there. And the chains fall off Simon Peter, and the door opens, and the angel, the guardian angel, leads him out of the place of incarceration, down out of the house where he's held captive, past all the guards, the 16 guards, that are all the way through, and he escapes, and he gets out. God has heard, and God has answered prayer, and God miraculously has shown himself mighty and released his servant because the people are praying. And you know, when we pray, God do the same thing for us. You know, we have guardian angels. You know, the angels are ministering spirits. Well, the interesting thing is it was a time to see the mighty hand of God, but it was also a time for the church when they were astonished. Now, what does Simon Peter do when they pray and he gets out of, out of prison? He goes to the place where they're gathered praying, and he's knocking at the gate. Hey, 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 and Rhoda. Here's the gate being knocked at, and she runs out, and she sees that Simon Peter. And she's so astonished by what she sees, she doesn't open the gate and let him in. She runs back to the prayer gathering and says, Simon Peter's out there. Now, they're human like us. You know that? Because you know what their response was? No, he's not. He's in prison. He must be dead. If you saw him, he must be dead because they believe that, that we have a guardian angel and that guardian angel looked like Simon Peter. So he's got to be dead. That can't be Peter. But yet when they saw it was him, they were astounded and astonished because God had heard and answered their prayers. They were astonished. Now here's the thing. They weren't perfect. They had an element of doubt, I guess. But the Bible says the prayer, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much and they prayed and listen to me church the world has yet to see what can happen in the kingdom of God if God's people come together in the effort of effective fervent prayer God will move out of heaven and God will show himself mighty but we have to pray and we say, well, we, I hear people and pastors, all of us, talk about the needs of our churches. I, I know the first thing some people do when they walk in on Sunday morning, they say, well, i got to see what the money's doing in here. Okay, look. And they open the bullet, and that's what they're concerned about right there. The money. Wow. Two weeks ago, 
We blew it out the wall. We didn't do so hot the other week. And you can, well, we're not meeting budget. Wonder why we're not meeting budget. Have you prayed about it? Does God own the cattle on a thousand hills? Yeah, he does. Do we assume that automatically the coffers are going to be full? Because folks are supposed to give. Well, I know what folks are supposed to do, but you know what? Folks are not doing what folks are supposed to do. So they need a little pride. Well, who's going to pride them? The Lord. I want to tell you something. The Lord has a way to move us that we can't even begin to imagine. He can put you flat on your back if he wants to. We ought to be, you know, we complain about those. We need budget. We need volunteers. Have we prayed about it? Are we praying about it? And the Lord's saying, you know, I've told you what you need to do. Have you prayed? you got to pray. And we try to figure out why maybe this isn't happening or that. Have you prayed? You have not because you ask not. So we need to pray. So the theme, I'm a church member. And I'm not just a church member. I will be a praying church member. And the Bible says we're to pray one for another. And so you need to be praying for the pastors. We need to be praying for the pastors. We need to be praying for the deacons. We need to be praying for the trustees. We need to be praying for the finance team. We need to be praying for every leader in the life of the church. We need to be praying for one another. We need to cover each other in prayer. Recently, I said to someone wanting to know what to do, they felt like they couldn't do anything. And I said, why don't you get your pictorial directory? You got one? Yeah. And why don't you go page by page, picture by picture, and pray for everybody. And just take five a day and spend some time praying over five families every day. Let's see what God will do. But it takes time. It takes discipline. You have to want to pray. And if we would pray, God would do something. We have to. To pray, we have to pray. Will you be a praying church member? The pledge is this. I will be a praying church member. I will pray for my pastors, the staff, the deacons, church leadership. I will pray rather than be a vocal critic of my pastor and church leaders. I will pray for God's power and strength to be manifested through our church to one another and to this community. See, it's not happening in the kingdom because God's people aren't praying. We have to pray. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to take more than five minutes a day. It's going to come in the spirit of desperation. In the spirit of desperation. Have you ever seen anybody get desperate for God? In the pastorate, I've seen parents get desperate for children. I, I, I saw a man fall on his face in a post office talking to me one time about a son that had a, an addiction problem, and he was so troubled about his son. He was a believer. The daddy was. He actually fell down on his face in the post office and started crying out to God. And I got down on my knees right there and joined him because he was so broken. He didn't care who saw, what saw, anything. He was desperate for God. And you got to have that desperation. When Matt got sick, I think, hey, how many hours we spent in prayer? Still praying. Go without sleeping at night. Get up in the middle of the night to pray. Desperation drives you to do that. And the Lord would say to me and even said to me in those days, okay, you're desperate for me to touch him. Are you desperate for me to touch your church? Are you desperate for me to touch your country? Are you desperate for me to touch America? Why aren't you praying to that degree of desperation for that to happen as you are for your son? We ought to be convicted by this church. We want to blame the pagans and lost people and drug dealers and pushers and all that. The reason it's so dark outside is because the light isn't any brighter than it is. That's us. And we're not praying. Other things are more important. And we've actually gotten caught up in the world. By the way, how do you live in this world, in this world which is so hard to compromise and compromise and compromise? How do you live a good life? How do you live a godly life? How do you live a life for God in a world where sin abounds and compromise is so easy? You've got to have a life connected to God in prayer so you can come up and 
touch base with God, take a big breath, and then come back in the world where it's stagnant and stale and hard, and you walk as far as you walk, and you go back up and take a breath with God, and you come back. That's the only way you can do it. We have to pray. And so I call all of us to be faithful to pray. Because praying can get what God can do. Let's pray. Father, I would confess for me, for us, for the church in North America, that you would forgive us for our prayerlessness. We're not praying for our neighbors. We're not praying for lost people as we are. We're not praying for marriages that are troubled. We talk about them, gossip about it. And Lord, you've given to us an avenue through which you work prayer. First of all, Lord, that we be driven to meet with you because we love you and we want to spend time in your presence, not because of what we can get from you. But help us, Lord, to be faithful to enter the prayer closet and enter the prayer room to pray. There are some situations and circumstances that people have told us are impossible. It can never happen. It can never be fixed. It can never be solved. It can never be healed. It can never be settled. Well, there's no never with you. Nothing's impossible. And so, Lord, help us to pray. Help us to believe. I pray you bless us in our giving and help us provide what we need and the resources we need. Help us with our volunteers. Give your people a heart for you to serve. And, Father, bless your church. Bless America. May the wind blow in this country again. The wind, mighty move of your spirit. Lord, speak to our hearts this morning about our prayer lives. And may we decide today to be disciplined in that, to love you and to meet with you every day in prayer. If someone here today that needs Christ, I pray you deal with that, Lord, and deal with them and speak to them through your spirit. But may we be obedient to your prompting this morning. We pray. In Jesus' name, amen.